we bought the property off uh, the Rainbow Valley property. We bought that in December of 1965. Uh, we bought that for $7,500. It seemed like an awful pile of money at that time, and we borrowed the money at that time from PEI Mutual Insurance Company <laughs> to buy the property. It was mostly a fallen down apple orchard, uh, the foundation of a couple of old houses, foundation of an old barn, some rusted farm equipment, an old truck, and a lot of old bushes and a swamp, which run through a cattail swamp, ran through the center of it. It was, it was, it, it was a, a swamp, and there's no, no, there's no way out of that. Anyway, we built the pond. We put in the ponds, and we hired Chesley Clark to kind of work on the property, Chesley started planting trees and he planted thousands and thousands of trees. And through 66 and 67 we we put in uh, you know various the trees, we put in the ponds, we cleaned up the thing, we started to cut grass. Groundbreaking would be in in 66 and we opened in 69. You know, Archie's doing was was he felt that we should be planting a lot of trees, and I'll give him marks for the trees. The trees were a big, were a big thing, thousands. I wouldn't know how many, but we planted thousands of trees. I think uh, we had something in Cavendish, in Rainbow. I think we had something like 23 different species of trees on the site. Probably by about uh, 68, I was kind of thinking we weren't going to weren't going to open or do anything. It was, you know, we weren't really making much progress. Uh, we didn't really. We we made the progress as we built the as we created the land, put in the water, planted the trees. All those things were 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 we were progressing, but then we couldn't seem to move off of that. And. There didn't seem to be a project, and uh, when uh, when we built the, the flying saucer, that was a structure. We now we now had started. We we were we had left the planting of trees and the cutting of the grass, and we had moved into a superstructures, and we were we were away at that. So that was the the start of that. When Rainbow Valley opened in 1969, we had basically a pond we had a, a, a bridge across the water a little run on the water there we had no gatehouse and we had a couple of picnic tables a couple of canoes a couple of rowboats and that was it anyway we went on from there the following year we put in the the barns the the, the little barn for the little animals, the, the petting, what they call the petting zoo today. Uh, we built the house where the washrooms are. We had a canteen and part of that, part of it was washrooms. We built the castle for the for the kitty slide and we put in some more boats and we got a couple of little paddle boats and we built some more picnic tables and we opened the place and that deer we opened it on the 4th of July and we charged 50 cents admission and Rainbow Valley was now rolling. I was kind of determined that we had to add things to the park if we were going to get traffic up, keep it going. And uh, I uh, started to build our first water slide. 
only had read up a bit about them. I didn't know that much about them, but I'd read up a little about them. And then I discovered that there was one had been installed over in Capolet in a campground over there. This fellow had built a, put a water slide in. So we went over and took the kids over and tried the water slide. And, you know, it seemed to be everybody. He gave us great praise on it, what, how great it was. And so then we decided, you know, then, was, then it was sort of, where do we get a water slide? Well. So I came back from there, and I discovered a fellow who had built had built water slides and had a moles, and he built them down in New Hampshire. So uh, went down, and we found him, looked at his his slides, and kind of made a deal with him that we we would get his moles. He would rent his moles to us, and we could make water slides. Anyway, on the way back, we talked about this and decided that we could build moles that were probably better than he had. And we set up and made our first water slide, and uh, then the next year we made another one. The next year, then we uh, another we added another one in a kitty slide, and then the following year we added another kitty slide and the speed slide. We were we were rolling in water slides. Uh, and every piece of that was built in our workshop. I think it was 84, our traffic would have increased because of the water slides by 64%. 87, we put put in the flume ride, and the first thing that, that I had the notion that I could create this ride and use the, using our existing moles. So we started in the fall of the year, we put in the mound that is there, we put up the tower, and we, you know, went ahead. <clears throat> you know, I had already drawn my plans on the back of a caterpillar calendar and uh, knew what we were going to do, and we started in the workshop creating pieces. I tried to add something new every year. That was a kind of a rule. You had to put something new every year into that park. And uh, we were always, you know, there was never a winter that we did not have projects on. We did the repair work, but we always had a new project that we were working on. And I had a feeling that I should spend at least a hundred thousand a year and new develop new capital, uh, like a reinvestment of capital. In the building of the water slides, we built all the components ourselves. Practically everything that we did at Rainbow was built by our own workshops. We had our own workshops, and uh, all of the fiberglass pieces were created and, and built. Um, we did, over the years, we did many things. We, we built fiberglass, more fiberglass buildings. We built, uh, you know, things like lab put in you know, we started to put in animation, we moved into animation, and I thought I need an artist. So I marked down in my book, I was sitting about an airplane, and I marked down in my book, see Mary Smith when you get back. So when I came back, I went to see Mary Smith and asked her if she would come and do painting for us and help us create things at Rainbow Valley. She had a talent which very few people had she could create things, she could see things, she could draw, and she seemed to always be able to grasp what I told her. If once I had the drawing, I could build it. If I could see the thing, you know, I, I, could, I could build it. I, it was all I needed. So, I mean, they were not drawings with dimensions on it. If, you know, if I needed dimensions, well, she would put dimensions on it, but mostly I didn't need dimensions. I just needed to see 
the drawing of what I wanted to build, and, and we could build it. So we built many things from there, like, um, you know, we the dark ride, monorail, the animals. first piece of animation was the fortune teller. He would sit there and tell you a story and his mouth worked and he opened and closed his eyes and you know the whole bit. <clears throat> so you know we created we created the animation for you know we, we that when we bought that animation after that we created most of the animation we had ourselves after that. We created the dark ride. Uh, Mary designed the dark ride and worked with us on it. Uh, Daryl Set up the computers, built the carry, helped build the characters. Mary did the <clears throat> Mary did all the faces for the characters, um, and helped helped dress them. On one occasion, we went to uh, a used clothing store to buy clothing to to clothe these people, and uh, and uh, we were having a great laugh about what we were going to put on this fellow, put on Chester or Harry or whichever the fellows were. <laughs> Well, basically, the Dark Ride was a ride based on the history of Prohibition and rum running. An awful lot of rum was landed on the sandy shores of Cavendish and hid in the sand hills and the woods in behind. And uh, you went aboard a boat, there was a captain. The captain was a, a, a robot that uh, was like an animated, char uh, an animated character who would turn and talk to the people. and. Uh, the boat, he started the boat up and uh, the boat started to rock as it went to sea and uh, then, uh, well actually at the same time the boat started to, to pull out, the turntable started, there was a door opened which opened onto a scene which was a, a boat scene, you were out, out in the ocean and the moon was up and you went out to get some rum off this rum runner and, and you followed the various scenes around and it told the story and eventually got down to a point of a fellow wheeling home a load of rum in a handcart and telling his wife that he didn't have rum, he had molasses. And she told him that you you don't you lie to me. I would never lie to you, my snookums. And if this here is rum May lightning strike me right where I stand. Lightning strikes him right where he, st right where he stands. So anyway, that's our rum running. That was our rum running story. In 95, 96, we built the monorail, which was a complete, complete Rainbow Valley project right from, from the engineering. Same as well, the same as the water slides was always engineered by us, but we did the engineering, and the creativity, and the erection, and installation, and operation. And I, I went to a local, <clears throat> a local firm, a local engineering firm in Charlottetown, and uh, they uh, asked them if I could hire their steel man. Well, yes, I could. So I did sit down in his office and spent two hours with him. And when I left, I had a drawing in my hand for what I needed in steel. He charged me $148 for his time, and uh, I was <laughs> I was on my way. The monorail cars were actually built. We we built them like a, like we would build a, a wooden boat. We, we built them out of wood. we built the original model out of wood and uh, shaped it in order to get the shapes we actually built it like we were building a, a wooden boat and we did it in strips and then, uh, like some of the wheels that were used on uh, cars were wheels that were normally used on potato diggers I mean you you know you go to something else for where you're looking for something there's going to be some abuse. You 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 get something. So they never we never had a failure in any of those wheels that we used that were off the potato off the potato off the potato diggers. I built a mold 
for the Rainbow Queen out of Masonite. I wanted a cheap mold, something that was going to be disposable and I could get the shape and uh, built the queen. One of the things I remember is a fella coming in, a local fisherman coming in one evening to the workshop when I was working on this. And uh, <clears throat> he wanted to know what I was doing and I told him what I was building and uh, he thought it was the most foolish thing he'd ever heard. And uh, you know, I always kind of think of that when I think of the queen and what he had said and then I think of how many people rode up and down that pond, sailed up and down that pond on that queen. You know, we built the, we had the notion to build this uh, sea monster. You know, you put a sea monster in the pond and it was a, it's been, I don't know how long ago we built, how many years that sea monster was in the pond, but the same sea monster has been there since the start. And uh, we were able to build uh, something that was very simple and very easy to work with, to work, to get the sea monster up out of the water, you know, up out of the water and back down again. And it was just amazing sometimes how you could create something out of nothing. I was very proud of the, the, the paratrooper. And it's there again, as people will say to you, lots of people will say to you, uh, you know, did these things go, did things go the way you planned it? Did you plan all this? And you try to explain, well, no, you didn't plan anything. Circumstances were, something happened. Circumstances made you do this. You did this because of circumstances. You probably went in a different direction. But, and the paratrooper is an example of that. We thought we needed a replacement for the roller coaster. like this. So John and I set out to buy a roller coaster. And we started trying to track down a roller coaster. Anyway, we rented, we picked up our car and at the airport and we headed for Pennsylvania. So we drove down. We went to this park, got a hold of the fellow we were to see. So he took us in and showed us the roller coaster and started it up and run it. And So we talked to him about it. and. Well, it was a good roller coaster, they liked it, but they had problems, you know, it was not a great, there, were, there was always some problems with this thing, it, you know, you had to have a good maintenance crew, you had you got to have a good maintenance crew to keep her running. Well, that, you know, that didn't tend to please me that much, and while we were talking, he said, you, you wouldn't like to buy a paratrooper. <laughs> I said, you got a paratrooper for sale? Well, yes, we got a beautiful paratrooper for sale and we looked at it and uh, he said it's one of the best pieces of equipment we had here and I was awful sorry to take it down but management wanted to put something else where that was <laughs> he said uh, we'll sell you that roller co or that paratrooper for twenty five thousand dollars and we'll load it for you and uh, well, I knew the price was good. Anyway, we went down and we, John and I went back down to the States and we went and hired a truck and uh, loaded her and hauled her back here. So that was how we acquired the paratrooper. We went for a roller coaster, but we come back with the paratrooper, you see. So. We built the giant fiddle. Mary designed the fiddle, and Mary and Garth and I built the built the fiddle. That we were able to create that sort of thing because of the fact that we worked with the fiber with fiberglass, and you know, in our shops. And... Well, it's 24 feet high, and we could have we could have went higher. We, you know, it was. I mean, it's her. It, it's it's Mary's fault. She 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 drew the. That's what she. That's what she drew, and that's what we built. I mean, if she do, if she'd have made it thirty feet, we'd have went thirty feet to see. So I had actually created the owl, and it was in this little cage, and it was in the cage, the same cage as it was now. So this is when the first talking owl was there. I put a speaker in the in the little house, and the owl come out, and talk to them. So an awful lot of features at Rainbow, these, a lot of things that 
people still talk about, like, you know, like the Troll, the Swinging Bridge, the Old Faithful, the Owl. spending more money in marketing at Rainbow Valley than a lot of these people in Cavendish were spending where we're getting in revenue. I mean our marketing account was bigger than their whole all the revenue they were getting. So they you know they weren't even, weren't interested in seeing anybody in marketing. There was more of them than there was of us. So uh, we got this committee set up and for about eight years seven or eight years, we did the marketing for Cavendish. It was done from our office. Mary and I would have done the work. Mary did most of the work. I more just made it possible that she could do it. And we did the marketing for Cavendish, which was the reason for getting that award for marketing. That was the Walt Wheeler Award for Media Award, which come on, which was, was either publication or marketing. And so we got an award for marketing, and we weren't marketers. I mean, we were not in the marketing business, but we got the award because we were doing a... Uh, Cavendish was actually created partially by Rainbow Valley. Rainbow Valley, we established Rainbow Valley in 1969. The National Park opened in 1939 which would be 30 years before. Green Gables was created after that. The golf course was put in and the National Park was operational in the area. Um, you know, you had some accommodations, you had people came to the beach, you had... Uh, when we came there, we started, and of course the numbers then started to come to Rainbow Valley. Property values raised because of the value of Rainbow Valley. You know, basically, Basically, Rainbow Valley, as far as we were concerned, there were three things that drove tourism. There was the National Park, there was Green Gables, and there was Rainbow Valley. Irene and I were married in 1972 and Rainbow Valley had been operating for a couple of years then and uh, in 1979 my wife and I bought out the shares of uh, Archie and Ivan. There was two children John and Jeff, Jeff I should say Jeff and John um, and the kids came, you know, they, they traveled, the young people, the, the kids traveled with me when I would be going down to Rainbow Valley on a Sunday to look at things, the little fellows would be with me. Uh, and I can remember Jeff coming back his first first time, he was just getting talking, coming back from Rainbow Valley and telling his mother that he had seen the Wendy tosses. And it took us a long time to figure out what he was talking about, but he had seen the flying saucer. But it was coming out when he tossed us, is that what we thought he was saying. And uh, so I suppose we should have realized from that that, that uh, the children grasped things very early because, you know, he was very small at that time. Now, as the children got bigger, and as the park expanded, then we needed more people to work. And of course, I had to call on Irene and say, you've got to come to work and, uh, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. And uh, 
help out and uh, you know she was home looking after the children and I, I built the talking owl all of a sudden I hit a talking owl but I had nobody to talk and I wasn't going to talk myself <laughs> I wasn't going to talk myself so I said to Irene this day you have to come down on Sunday and we're going to try to do that talking owl so she did the talking owl that day and the kids played around and and uh, it was a success and at that point we realized we had to keep it going and uh, it was uh, it was a trial run that day and and so then uh, she made, she started to gradually move into parts of the operation of the park and and look after various things and uh, sometimes she did the owl and sometimes she did other things well then we decided the children were pretty much, you know, you couldn't, no place to leave them. We'd, they'd come to Rainbow Valley and they'd run around all day. And they seemed to have no trouble to spend the day there. And, uh, you know, the first year or two they were around, you were wanting to find out where are the people coming from that are at Rainbow Valley. So at 2.30 every afternoon, I would send them out to the park with a pad out to the parking lot to mark down and we'd, we'd make the sheet with Prince Edward Island, P in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, the whole thing in sheets and they were to make a mark for every every car and they would go out and they would do this and then they were entitled to go to the canteen and get anything they wanted. I told them they were supposed to get milkshakes but a lot of times they got whatever they wanted but they would go to the canteen and they would get something to eat and you know, a treat, and that was pay for going out to the parking lot. Well then, once they were old enough to fit in, uh, if they needed an extra person at the boats, you know, even when the kids were, were eight, nine, and ten years old, I mean, they could go to the, go to a boat place, they could hand out life jackets at the swans, they could uh, help people out of a boat and uh, at the dock, they, they, you know, they were, they were valuable for all of those things, so... So then we set up a little shop for a couple of years. We had a little magic shop going and the boys worked in the magic shop and they sold, they could sell three and four hundred dollars a day in the magic shop. We put somebody else in there and they wouldn't sell for seventy five dollars, but these two young fellows could do the tricks and they would demonstrate the tricks. And Well, it was great to have, great to have the boys and great to know that they were there and you counted on them for, for lots of things. Uh, you seem to depend on them more than you probably did on other people because because of who they were and uh, uh, they didn't always believe they should be working for the old man but uh, all in all it was a good it was a good relationship a good time and we had no summers the only like they had their summer was at Rainbow Valley and uh, I used to think that uh, well I often said to John had worked he was 29 years old and he had worked <clears throat> he had worked for 20 summers with us you know and uh, had never had a summer off you know there was no there was no vacation there was no time for vacation but you know we did take the boys with us when we would go to the conventions down in the states and uh, and we would go to see other amusement parks and things so they got some advantages that other kids didn't get okay. Jeff went away to university and then went off, you know, he went off to work. Uh, he had, <clears throat> I think Jeff felt at that time he had been in, at the park long enough. John was great, ready to go on further and stay with the park. And uh, But they were a part of the park as long as, as long as uh, they've been around. They've always been a part of the park. But actually Irene, did take over the gift shops and the buying of the, you know, she early on she took over the buying of the gifts for the gift shops and, uh, and eventually the operation of the gift shops and uh, she more or less managed that part of the operation with the, the women in the gift shops and the gate the gate part of the operation and plus the gift shop stock. Quite often she was involved with the hiring of the young people, the interviews, and actually she pretty much every year she was involved in the interviewing the young people and talking to them. And um, 
Uh, sometimes I felt she could relate to the young people better than I could. turned out to be the best year we ever had, simply because we were having a going at a business sale. <laughs> and it, it, uh, it has been an exceptional year. We have uh, had an awful lot of outpouring of grief, of sadness, of tears. We have an awful, have had an awful lot of expressions of uh, sort of thank you expressions for for the past and what we had done. We uh, had never had much coverage in newspapers before. There's hardly been a day in the past six months that we haven't made the newspapers. It uh, it just uh, just sort of been sort of hard to believe what has taken place and what has happened here. People call to explain, to tell us, you know, what a great time they'd had at Rainbow Valley in the past and how they enjoyed it and how they wanted to, to thank us. Knowing that changes had to come within the operation, knowing that I could not go on forever, that nothing goes on forever, and my family and I talked about it, and we thought, you know, it might be a good time to to leave, to to dispose of the park, to make a decision to to move, and we looked at you know, who was going to buy the park, where would we buy the park, who would we sell the park to. And my thought was in some cases that if we sold it to somebody else, they definitely wouldn't operate it as we had. They might survive, they might be successful, they might not. It was not something I wanted to see left you know, on the side of the road in Cavendish, there's a thing going downhill and hearing people talk about, the, you know, the rundown park, if that happened. It was an accident that they more or less took me to the National Park and we met and uh, on another matter, I talked with the park on another matter and uh, all of a sudden they, uh, you know, indicated that they would like to buy the park if we wanted to sell it. And uh, it just seemed suddenly like a wonderful, wonderful thing. They would be a great person, they would be a great group to sell to. You know, it would be uh, uh, part of the National Park and it would be there for, for all time. So that was probably basically the reason we sold the park. So with the, with the park buying the property, it it would leave it for all time that the property could be enjoyed by people from all over, where if it had to fell into private hands and uh, people had developed it for some other purposes, even other than a park, uh, it would not be, you know, not be available for people. People had enjoyed it for many years, actually 37 years it has been enjoyed by people and uh, um, it can be enjoyed for many, many years hereafter by, you know, people will be able to travel on it and see what's going on. And we feel that the park will do a good job and to do us proud. standing out on the balcony of the Rainbow Room to be out of people's way and 
this man came out and leans over the rail and says, he said, uh, will it be missed? I said, well, if you call a million dollar payroll something, something to be missed, it'll be missed. I said, uh, a lot of children got their education from this place. Uh, I said, uh, a lot of money distributed through the country because of this place. And uh, I said, yeah, it'll be missed.